So first of all, how are you doing? I'm incredibly tired, but I'm doing okay. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, how was, I believe you played at the Vera Project last night. How did mm -hmm. that show end up going? It was great. The last time I played there, it went, it went so poorly, I vowed to not play Seattle for several years. But last night went really well, entirely redeemed. That's awesome. And then, uh, is this your first time playing in Bellingham? Or? I played a solo show here in 2003 at like a, like a, house, a house show. Oh. Wow. But that was the only other time. Yeah, I was trying to find some information on Yeah, never, never, uh, never uh, show at a venue. Yeah, no, nothing like that I'd quite seen around here. Um, and then I guess what makes you stoked on uh, playing the Alt Library or something like this? This seems like a place that is very well suited to kind of the aura of Shoo Shoo. Oh, um, the books probably will make it sound interesting. <laughs> For sure, absolutely. Um, and then I had a bit of an interesting question for you. You um, are a big fan of film. I've kind of found out through a bunch of different interviews, and of course, the name Shu Shu coming from Shu Shu the Set Down Girl. I was kind of worrying. Or I was kind of wondering, um, are there any other films in a cert in a similar vein to the Set Down Girl, and just that utter devastation that you'd uh, recommend to film fans out there? Oh, probably any Lars von Trier film. Uh, most David Lynch movies, uh, almost any film made in Japan from 1965 to 1979. Uh, it's a movie I saw that came out last year called, earlier this year I think, called Capernaum. It was pretty soul destroying. Uh, any Bergman film. Uh, almost any film with Isabelle Huppert in it. Uh, there's no shortage of, <laughs> of films to, to destroy your heart. <laughs> there's all kinds of devastating films like that. And then I guess kind of keeping with the idea of films, which that's a very comprehensive list to work off of. I was reading on those uh, liner notes you have for the uh, new album on Bandcamp. You mentioned, uh, I believe it's Jack Smith's film, uh, Normal Love. Um, you just kind of want to talk about like how that worked into the writing of the song. Was it, did you see that film and just kind of like the idea for the song came out or it was, was it more something just kind of in the back of your head while making the song? Uh, in that case it wasn't, it's, it's a little difficult to put into words. It was a, more of an emotional response. I have a tremendous admiration for Jack Smith and his, uh, uh, being so extraordinarily ahead of his time in terms of combining uh, elements of psychedelia and surrealism with queer politics and you know, over-the-top bizarro sexuality. Uh, so it just sort of, I mean, obviously that type of approach is fundamentally influential to what we've been muddling through for the past several years. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't so much a, a direct linear nod to that movie as much as it was uh, about what the topic is about, but then also a sort of little kiss on the cheek to Jack Smith in addition to what the song is about. Gotcha. And I know you've, um, you've noted how like you'll kind of pay your respects to certain artists, whether it's through covers or through names of songs and stuff like that. Um, but I kind of wanted it's, it's, to... Uh, yeah. Just exactly like that, yeah. Exactly. So um, I kind of building off that idea of like, you know, queer politics, sexual pol politics, and kind of the oddities that come with those certain relationships and all that. Um, we were just talking about in the car, car earlier how Shoo Shoo's kind of approach to relationships um, is one of the most unique draws to your music. Um, how do you think that's portrayed best on the album outside of songs like Normal Love where it's very kind of in your face? Oh, I'm, I'm absolutely the wrong person to ask how something is portrayed the best. I have no perspective <laughs> on it. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you he'll listen to a song 250 times where you're working on it, uh, it becomes sort of a blank wash. Uh, I'm sure you have it, it would have a better conception of that than I would if you have listened to the record. For sure, yeah. Um, and then, Although a fair question. Yeah, and then um, I think also talking about the new record, one of my favorite things about Shu Shu personally is just all the quotable lines in it. Uh, one of my favorites from the album being her boob gets so floppy she uses it as a fan to wave away his, his sickening B.O. Um, 
which the first it's track... It's very funny to hear someone just <laughs> recite that in a casual way. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of all the different ones I could cite. Um, the other one I actually, like, the first time I heard it on the record was uh, To Be a Human Being, You Have to Eat Garlic. The first time I heard that, it was like that weird kind of absurdist sort of thing that comes with some shushu well, lyrics. That, that actually comes from Angela saw, uh, improvised her part of that. That's from the song Pumpkin Attack for Mommy and Daddy. She got very drunk and then just improvised all of her lyrics and then we edited them. But that's, that's part of uh, Korean mythology. She oh, was really? going on the long scree about aspects of Korean mythology and how it factored into growing up super Christian and also somewhat shamanistic in her, her family. And that's a, it was a, like, uh, an aspect of the belief system she grew up with. Yeah, for sure. And like, so the, the origin of humanity came from a, a a bear who had to eat garlic in order to become a, a human. That's a horrible move on the bear's part. <laughs> a horrible, for sure. Yeah, I like. I don't know. When listening to that song, there's a lot of lyrics like the first listen I'll have with them on a Shushu record. Um, I'll just be kind of like, that's weird. I don't know what to think about that. But that line in particular, I was listening to it in context of, um, you know pumpkin attack on mommy and daddy and I was like you know this is absurdist but there's something deeper to that so it's awesome that, to have that perspective on it as well for sure um, and then uh, kind of going back to um, these interesting kind of like one-liners or few liners quotables from the album um, with the song Mary Turner Mary Turner which has gotten all sorts of press about just you know how devastating of a story that is. One of my favorite uh, lines is from the end of that, which you've made a um, pin of. It's a uh, fuck your guns, fuck your wars, fuck your truck, and fuck your flag. Um, I think that plays into this amazing kind of like, I don't know, just like frustration with modern politics that, you know, goes throughout the whole album. Do you, uh, I guess, was there anything outside of like, you know, feminist politics and queer politics that went into this just kind of brutal aspect of this album, I guess. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> if you exist at this moment, there is your answer. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, yeah. I just, I don't know. It's This album, more than a lot of other Shushu albums, seems a lot more brutal than it does, like, I guess... Um, I don't want to go as far as to say depressive because I think there's some Shushu albums that are like sad and depressive, but there's a bit more than that. There's some enlightening aspects, but this one, like from the first song, you have these tribal Haitian Yoruban drums and I don't know, something about it feels so brutal. I wanted to kind of know about that approach to this new record. Oh, I, 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 I think it was a, to, I mean, to me, I mean, other people who worked on it have a different perspective on it than I do. Um, uh, but I, I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit. I mean, it's just as a response to potentially, you know, being in the last couple of decades of habitation on this planet, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, the extraordinary. I mean, nothing that people don't think of, who have a brain don't think about. I mean, just the rapid dis destruction of uh, democratic politics and uh, and civil rights, you know, all over the world and. Uh, the the in, in increase of cruelty as, as an, an acceptable form of public behavior. Um, it's 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 hard not to be consumed by it. Yeah. Uh, and then I mean, it, I don't know if this was a conscious res response or an unconscious response. Uh, Angela and I both became more interested in. Uh, Satanism and not necessarily becoming Satanists, but satanic history, demonic history, demonic encyclopedias, uh, and uh, the sort of demonic possession of, uh, of uh, children, both literally and as an allegory. Um, so all, all, all of those things together, I, I think you were quite correct in saying it's a, it's a more of a pummeling and aggressive record than others that we've done. For sure, and it seems like I don't want to say it's like outwardly political, but I feel like other aspects of it are. But yeah, for know, sure. Some of them are. But um, I think that kind of brings me to um, wanting to ask about kind of kind of how Deforms the Unborn um, kind of worked into this album because it seems like from reading once again through the liner notes and just knowing that general process of 
doing that whole performance for the Guggenheim, how that kind of played into making this new record? It was, it's a, uh, I, I, so Deformed the Unborn was a, a, a concert that uh, Chess Smith, Devin Hoff, Angela saw and myself at the Guggenheim that was a part of the Jan Vo, who was an artist that we've collaborated with in the past. Um, he, uh, he asked us to, he had a retrospective there and he asked us to compose some, some music for it. And it was initially based on um, a couple of pieces that he had done on the movie The Exorcist and as I would mentioned before it then got us interested in exploring children who have been literally and figuratively possessed. Uh, so the, the text from that particular piece was uh, uh, just taken from uh, reading uh, several texts on that subject and then just it's, it's a you know kind of common practice for just without thinking writing down lines and you know filling up a couple notebooks of lines and then going through it and picking out the lines um, that felt as if they could illustrate what it would like to what it would be like to be demonically possessed um, and so uh, so that set of lyrics kind of and that show sort of served as a prologue to the record growing basket of fruit um, Probably half the record on, I mean, half the lyrics on the record are taken from that text from Deforms the Unborn. And there's a, uh, although the music is not unrelated, um, uh, um, the, the uh, conceptually they're, uh, they could, they're related. Uh, Deforms the Unborn is very much about one topic, and maybe three or four of the songs on Grow with Basket of Fruit share the topic that. Uh, 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 share that topic with Deforms the Unborn. Gotcha, yeah. We almost actually named the record Deforms the Unborn, but Angela felt it diverged too much and that, uh, that it was certainly a nod to it and we had borrowed a lot from it. And uh, But it, um, she thought it was it. Uh, it was not, the record is not only about that subject, so she thought we should. Yeah, for sure. It. It's really interesting that like, I don't know, while it's not Obviously, it's not the same thing. I think it definitely comes out of a similar headspace, like you talked about. Yeah, yeah, de definitely. Demonic yeah, yeah. possession and all that. Um, and then one thing I find really interesting about Shushu's music in general, as well as like you've often talked about, you kind of try and go into each new project, not necessarily with like a clear idea of how it should sound, but just kind of playing around and seeing, you know, how can we make this work in an entire project. But you've also talked about for this new record, it was the most like. I guess it was the most aesthetically researched, um, I think you said something around That's a around fair way to put it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was like, there was a lot of like reading and um, citing back to previous works of art or literature that went into that, went into this. So do you think, I guess in the making of this album, how did those aesthetic aspects of research play into the creation of this new album? Oh, it was, I, I kind of mentioned it a little bit just in how the lyrics were developed on the other records not entirely but by and large they were narratives on about particular events or experiences uh, and this one was much more a, a, about a res response to uh, the possibility that you know civilization could be ending within our lifetimes and one of the few redeemable things that humans have done on that very short list is you know uh, being involved in aesthetics uh, so, uh, sorry, all these two different bass lines are freaking me out. I can't concentrate no on my stupid answer. Um, uh, I don't even know what ridiculous, dumb thing I'm trying to say. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so I, 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 I think I think it just it just had to do more with the process in which the, the lyrics were uh, were taken. Just in the same way that Deforms the Unborn, where we just expanded it on that or kept going with that and going through lots of texts and taking lines from them, or or seeing an image and writing down an, a non-thinking first impression of the image, and, um, and then uh, editing them afterwards. I mean, we we probably used you know five percent of the things that that were collected for it. Uh, and it's you know it's it's as much a a, a tribute to uh, and like I said those aesthetic influences uh, as it is just a subconscious exploration. Um, it, it's I mean it's not a particularly new way to work, but it's a way that we have not worked on lyrics before. For sure. And then um, I guess thinking you know on the same wave of like aesthetic influences. Um, 
the merch you have put out for this new record is extremely creative. The robes and then the pillows and all that. <coughs> I can't take any credit for that. It was all um, a person named Maddie who works at our label Polyvinyl. Really? She, did, she did almost all of it, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering. He was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I just kept seeing all these band <coughs> notifications that was like, Shushu has added this new piece of merchandise or whatever. I was like, I'm going to have to look into getting a bathrobe. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's been, we uh, occasionally people wear them to shows. It's always, it kind of gets cute to see it. <laughs> it must be really fun. I guess it's speaking fun. of like fans and fan interaction, all that, uh, we were all wondering what one of your like favorite or I guess weirded, weirdest interactions with the Shui has been. Oh, 99% of the time they're not weird. They're almost always incredibly sweet and nice. We are uh, have, uh, I've said this a bunch of times before, but almost every band we've ever toured with has said we have the nicest audiences of it that they've ever played with, and I, I disagree. I mean, I totally agree. I don't disagree <laughs> at all. I trillion percent do not agree with that I said disagree. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the people are always incredibly smart, uh, open emotionally. Uh, politically astute, super cute, funny, generous. Um, yeah, it's hard to, I mean, it's really not that weird. I mean, there have been some uh, people who have crossed some lines in terms of being stalkery and inappropriate, um, but in, un, in uninteresting ways. Yeah. Uh, just emailing too much. There's one person who's threatened to kill me a lot of times, um, and I saw him uh, about two years ago. He scared the shit out of me. I hadn't heard from him in a while. <laughs> oh my lord! It was, um, but I mean, that could happen if you, you know, work at the gas station. I mean, exactly. That, yeah, uh, that could happen with anybody. Uh, but yeah, just in uh, in almost every instance, uh, talking with people who come to shows is, or talking with people over the internet is um, very sweet. Yeah, that's awesome. And I guess just to kind of finish this out and talk a bit about the live aspect of the show, um, you've brought on Thor Harris to do live stuff and then I uh, believe Chris uh, who both ex-members of the newest iteration of Swans and all that so uh, I guess how was that brought about did you know that you wanted to in incorporate them live I know you'd worked with Thor on the Angel Guts album mm -hmm. a bit so uh, yeah I uh, had been playing with a percussionist named Shana Dunkelman for several years who I had to fire because she became lazy and arrogant and weird and I was trying to think of how to put a new band together uh, and uh, Thor and I have been friends for gosh 12 or 13 years and of uh, and uh, I, I opened for Swans a few times doing uh, like a, a solo thing so I toured with him a bunch I knew he was easy and fun to tour with and I love his playing uh, so I asked him if he uh, would be up for it and uh, lucky luckily he said he would be um, and then we had had another keyboard player uh, named Jordan Geiger who was going to do it. We rehearsed them for a week and then the day we were leaving for the tour he freaked out and quit the band. So it, my uh, response to situations like that is just go fuck it and just quit <laughs> music forever. Yeah. And then Thor who is a, a lot more level headed than me said well let's give Christopher Pravdika a call. And uh, he called him and he said, hey Chris, what are you doing tomorrow? You want to go to Europe for five weeks? And uh, astonishingly, Christopher was available and wanted to do it. And uh, it worked out actually great. He's 20 times a musician that, that Jordan is and uh, infinitely more fun to hang out with. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know how I managed to be so fortunate to play with such uh, fantastic musicians it's uh, uh, extraordinarily rewarding to, to get to play with them every night they're, they're excellent excellent players and just decent guys yeah they seem like really like huge sweethearts I was they hearing are. them yeah. talking both of them are. Thor was talking all about the art he was seeing around here and it just sounded so enthusiastic about everything yeah it's, it's good for me I mean I'm pretty nihilistic and crabby uh, most of the time and that he has a good attitude helps me to have a better attitude which I, I mean being nihilistic and crabby is not any fun it gets a little I get super tired of my own obnoxious view of the world so having him shine a light on things is a great relief for sure and then I guess just as a kind of final thing this probably won't even be in the video uh, we like to do a thing with inter uh, with the people we interview and um, 
you know, in studio artists and all that, where we just have them do a legal ID. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just say, um, this is Jamie Stewart from Shushu, and you're tuned in to, tuned in to KUGS FM Bellingham. Should I say it to this? Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Aloha. This is J A M I E S T E W A R T of the band X I U X I U. And you are listening to K Hugs. Just kidding. K U G S. <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> <laughs> 